We're speaking about digital transformation at a major insurance company. Baluas is a 9 billion financial service company, a pan-European player in the European market. We are currently in five countries. Headquarters is in Switzerland. As Chief Technology Officer, I have the pleasure um, to be a member of the board at Baluas Group being responsible for the IT function across um, the whole group and being at the same time the sponsor of our mobility innovation activities, um, which is part of our diversify the core strategy. Alexander, a lot of your focus is around innovation and digital transformation and digital strategy. So, so why don't we begin there? Tell us about your digital strategy. Nowadays, there shouldn't be a digital strategy. There should only be a business strategy. And ultimately, it's about what value you deliver to the customer. And um, there was a time when you had your business strategy and a separate portfolio of digital activities. But now digital is part, essentially, and at the core of each of our business activities. So that's why I think it should only be called a business strategy, which is IT-enabled nowadays. So our strategy is, is very simple. We, be, we want to become a technology and ultimately data-driven um, financial service company that makes the life of our customers simpler and safer. So the, the core and the name of our strategy is simply safe. What does it mean? It's, uh, it's uh, quite a simple concept. It's based on the assumption that engaged and empowered employees lead to happy and loyal customers which then generate cash and successful return for the company and the shareholder. And that is essentially the core of our Simply Safe strategy. You just described two aspects that I think we need to explore. Number one is you said that you are an IT enabled digital company. That's where you're going. And number two, you spoke about customer experience, you spoke about employee experience and customer experience. So let's let's take these apart. Let's begin with being an IT enabled, a digital company. For you, what does that mean? It means essentially providing an omni-channel service to our customers and always be as digital as possible, but always human as one of our CEOs likes to say. And um, it means that nowadays, the reality is that our life is, is not black and white, analog and digital, but we are acting across the boundaries of both environments. And what we want to do as Baloas is um, to leverage the, the innovation potential of technology to provide simple and value-adding services to our customers to make their life simpler and safer. And uh, nowadays, it means both in a digital as well as in a human um, capacity and environment. And the combination of both, I think, is the key. If you think about it, um, and if you link it to the other components, the, the key objectives of our strategy are threefold, which, which pick up on that theme that you mentioned with employee and customers. We have three goals, which is um, become the employer of choice in our upcoming strategic period um, from 22 to 25 um, and become a top five employer of choice in Europe because we think that empowered and engaged employees, as I mentioned in the beginning, are driving the success. And if you want to have a good customer experience, there is this famous quote that I subscribe to, a good customer experience requires a good employee experience. And that is where the two things come together and uh, lead then also to the second goal in our strategy, which is to attract uh, 1.5 million new net customers in that strategic period. Kind of surprising to me to hear you speak uh, speak this way about the the business and employee experience, because you're the chief technology officer, and I think we tend to think about the CTO as being focused more or less entirely on the technology. I believe that IT is always a tool to achieve a certain outcome, and the outcome should always be the business capability and the customer value that is generated. And um, 
obviously nowadays uh, technology plays a vital role in both the customer experience, providing new customer journeys and all the stories around that. But if you think about it, um, and if you think about a scenario, for example, as we are um, a strong insurance um, player, if you think about a scenario in a claims setting, then um, you have different aspects where technology is very important, but it's only an enabler for delivering the value to the customer. One example is customer calls into the call center. If it takes our employee five minutes to find the relevant information, you will not provide a good customer experience and you will have a very frustrated employee. So obviously it's in our interest to create a good employee experience that they can very easily and, and uh, in, an, in an efficient way answer the question and provide the service to our customer. In this way, the employee experience is driving the customer experience. And the second example is the customer is nowadays um, exploring different ways to engage us and has different expectations. And we use technology to address those expectations. For example, I have a 17 year old daughter. If I want to communicate with her, I can try to give her a traditional phone call, but that will probably not be so successful. So I have to engage her in a favorite messaging app. And if that is the reality where, the, where many of our customers are acting, then this should also be IT enabled. And that's why, for example, we, from a technology side, thought about that and enabled the first um, banking messenger service in Switzerland, bringing safe banking to the messenger platform of your choice. Or in the claim scenario that I mentioned, we also use asynchronous messenger-based communication to reduce the cycle time with our customers from sometimes days and weeks to minutes and hours if you can do it via messenger. So that's where the CTO part is very much about finding solutions to improve the customer experience and ultimately the partner and, cust and, and customer experience in that way, which links the dimensions together. How does this guide your technology decisions? People and culture are more a little bit the, the secret source of Baloas and uh, at the core of our strategy. And there you have this saying, culture is eating strategy for breakfast, but you could also say culture is shaping business strategy, right? And in this way, um, we, are, we are linking the technology choices um, to the enablement of our workforce, trying to empower them, not only from an authority and, and process point of view, but also give them the tools and the equipment to work with an end-to-end -end responsibility for their services. If you think about it, the target picture is a little bit um, using the microservice approach from a technologist's aspect, where you compartmentalize different services and make them independent from each other. Um, we try to do that also with service and product teams so that they that we enable them to be able to, uh, in a self-sustained manner, be able to develop their services forward. Elaborate on that, because in a sense, what you're saying is you're using microservices to support your culture strategy. How does that work? We have essentially the, the concept that, or the, the belief that... Um, employees can drive the change process of a company and bring it up to light speed. And the challenge is, is when you develop a change agenda and a strategy, often you're, you have a very academic or analytical approach to it. And you're essentially um, uh, providing a good plan with, with deliberate choices but you're you're lacking you're touching the mind but you are not touching the heart of your workforce and that's why we think if you if you have a change plan you need to have both and you need to engage your cust uh, your employee base also on the emotional side and that is that is a key activity in our transformation which is essentially also a cultural journey so it goes beyond making employees feel good, right? I mean, I'm sure it sounds like that's a part of it, but only a part of it. 
It also puts them into the driver's seat of the change. For example, at the beginning of our current Simply Safe journey, we developed a concept of sparks, which is um, in each organization, you have the informal leaders that are networked in the organization and can drive change and influence um, opinions and, and developments. And um, we ask those colleagues to be part of our strategy journey and help us to develop the culture in which we would work. And for example, this Spark community became a multiplier for our strategy work and uh, delivered, for example, what we call our internal code of conduct, our Baloas code, which then has obviously the, the look and feel and the relevance for the, for the employee workforce and is much more accepted and uh, drives our strategy forward. So it's not only about feeling good, it's also about um, taking decentral ownership and responsibility, um, which is a challenge because it is an additional burden, right? Suddenly you become a driver's seat. You, you need to take decisions. You need to take ownership, which might be not as simple as uh, being told what to do. So it's, uh, but, but I think this engagement and this ability to create change is actually a track helping us to retain develop and attract talent, which we all know nowadays is very important. So digital transformation for Balois Group that begins with culture change and empowering employees. It's not a tech, digital transformation is not primarily a technology, a set of technology activities. Is that correct? I would agree with that, and I think you have you have a ben you have multiple dimensions there. You need the technology to enable the ways of working and the capabilities that employees can work in a in a certain way. Not to use the agility word, but with new ways of working, and in this way, be closer connected to their customers and and iterate in smaller cycles. What I mean by that is, if you, for example, want to introduce um, uh, new ways of working in the business, and you do not have the technical uh, uh, capabilities to implement change quickly, um, then it doesn't help you to have sprints and all the creative processes on the business side or in co-created environments. So you need the technical capabilities. That's why we started our backbone modernization already a couple of years ago. And we continue that with our current journey to the cloud to build the capabilities to support new ways of working in our workforce, but also to then expose these new capabilities to our partner and customers. And in this way, it goes through all three dimensions, technology, workforce, customer, and partners. And if you only do one, if you only do front-end modernization, you will run into a problem. Or if you only do cultural change, you will run into a problem because you cannot IT enable it. So I'm of the strong opinion that you need all three layers to be successful in your journey. What I find particularly interesting and, and unusual is the, the very explicit relationship between the technology infrastructure and the business goals, even expressed in terms of the culture and the working relationships. Very, I've, I've heard very few people make that explicit linkage in such a way. And that, I think, is one of the unique components. And um, uh, that is also where um, we also drive our, for example, our innovation uh, strategy in that way, that we include there um, both the technology aspect as well as the cultural aspect to be also attractive for partners and external um, innovation, let's say, stakeholders. For example, we built a track record in this way to work um, quite successfully with uh, up-and-coming startups in a way where we try to act as a startup at that interface and uh, engage um, on eye level there. And uh, that helps us now to be an attractive partner in our markets for the emerging fintech and insure tech community. So in this way, this investment in, in IT capabilities and our cultural capabilities is also paying off on the business side by being an attractive partner for 
um, all the the developments in the new ecosystems. What are the what are the challenges associated with this kind of approach? We are a company that is over 150 years old, and um, we have obviously a, a strong and proud history. And one of the challenges are obviously the the mega trends in the market that um, everybody is facing to a certain extent, which is the changing um, socioeconomic trends, new customer expectations and behaviors. But um, also from an insurance and banking point of view, we have the challenges of uh, growing regulation of the very long-term low interest rate environment, which um, put also pressure on our change activities to reinvent how we work in this environment from an asset allocation and liability point of view. And um, we also have the challenge of overcoming our internal complexity and also our technical debt. So we need to be very rigorous and we call it radical simplification to focus our core, meaning we want to streamline product and services to reinvent how we deliver our business capabilities and our services to our, our customers and partners. That's where all the topics of customer journeys and so forth are in. But also we believe that insurance is coming under pressure and you need to diversify to be successful in the future. And that's where our uh, activities outside of the core and the new ecosystems and broader um, uh, fintech environments are happening. But the fourth complexity is the, is the cultural change. And that is not only the behavior part that we already discussed, but also the topic of uh, strategic skilling and talent development, which for us is very important. For example, we allow all our employees 10% of their time for continuous learning, because we strongly believe that if you want to be successful in an ever-changing and faster-changing market environment, you need to have a very skilled and up-to-date workforce to be able to help you weather the storms of current markets. In some respects, you sound more like a Silicon Valley company than a 150-year-old startup with what you're trying to accomplish. We aspire to be an innovation leader in our markets. So in the last um, strategic period, we invented 200 million in our uh, investments in innovation, uh, predominantly in the ecosystems of home and mobility. We want to even strengthen that in the upcoming period. And um, we also made it official um, in a way that we said, beyond our three core objectives of um, being a top five employer of choice, um, attracting 1.5 million net new customers and, and generating 2 billion in cash. We also want to generate an innovation portfolio that has a unicorn status. I always call it a portfolio unicorn. So you know about startup unicorns when they have an individual valuation of exceeding $1 billion. For us, the aspiration is that the sum of the valuation of our innovation activities by 2025 should match or exceed $1 billion in valuation. And uh, this shows you that, that we go beyond insurance and asset management and banking, and also strongly believe in the opportunities given in the innovation and diversify the core aspect. We have an interesting question from Twitter. Arsalan Khan, who's a, who's a regular listener, thank you for listening and for your great questions, Arsalan, asks, he makes the comment, digital transformation can be harmed by preconceived biases of what technology can and can't do from both non-IT and IT people. So what steps do you take to address these preconceived biases of how things should work or how we've always how we've always done it apart from the bias the challenge is that usually people do not know what they do not know so the challenge for example with data and using data in innovative ways is often that the possibilities of uh, machine learning based analytics or other capabilities natural language processing you name it is often not well understood and we um, 
we are basically following a multi-step approach to educate ourselves and our stakeholders on what is possible and not possible. One is the self-learning that I already mentioned. Um, the other one is that we are also active as a corporate venture capital company with a successful portfolio of about 20 investments by now. In this way, we, we tap into the emerging streams of innovation that are happening predominantly in the European and North American markets to help us understand what is truly possible because we are biased for, by our legacy, right? We, we are a successful company, um, but we did it in a way that was possible with the processes and technology of the past. And we want to leverage the opportunities of the future. So we have the self-learning, we have the corporate venture capital arm, we have our open innovation network. So we tap into academia, we tap into competitors, um, into partners to help us better understand what is possible in today's world. Um, but you learn every day something new. So you will never be safe from bias. You just try to challenge yourself to look at things from different um, aspects to limit the impact of your personal bias. What are the kinds of metrics or KPIs that you use to evaluate your progress? These are predominantly our top targets. So are we truly becoming a top five employer of choice in Europe? We are well on track to achieve our intermediate target of becoming a top 10 employer of choice um, with regards to the uh, financial service industry. The second one is obviously um, the belief that if you do something right, you manage to attract new customers, which leads us to our second KPI, the growth of 1.5 million net customers in very mature and saturated insurance markets, which already implies that you need to also tap into some new innovative customer groups as well to generate that growth. And cross and upselling is not counting. So these are actually net new customers. And then the external market evaluation of our innovation. If we achieve to become essentially a portfolio unicorn um, with an opportunity value of 1 billion, then it also shows that that innovation is basically on the right track. These are three examples how we measure the success. We have another question or comment from Twitter, quite an interesting one. Uh, Kawaja Sheikh makes the point that technical debt through revenue generation and cost optimization is crucial. But he's saying, what about design debt, design thinking, the need to be thinking in a forward-looking way? How do you manage that, given that you're 150 years old? I think it is a challenge for, for everybody. And I agree that um, we also have our iceberg of uh, technical debt, how Dean Hinchcliffe is always uh, mentioning it. Um, so we are working on that, and, and that is also one of our focus topics. What we are doing um, is that from a design point of view, we are trying to follow this open innovation approach and also the co-creation with customers and partners um, to come up with new ideas and to better understand their requirements. But it's a journey. Um, are, we, are we already where we want to be? No, we we need to continue to be simpler and safer also in our thinking. And um, I always refer to it as the uh, basically the challenge of past success, because you might be biased in thinking that your old approach is also the one that makes you successful in the future. And uh, there we just continue to challenge ourselves in a continuous basis. And the best way to do it from my point of view is work in increments get feedback and learn from that. And uh, in this way, you get the external feedback, which might rock you out of your comfort zone, because what you expected the feedback to be might not be the feedback you receive. So it sounds then that open innovation, the ecosystem that you're building, all of this is very important to help the organization refocus and reshape its thinking, kind of uh, 
yes, you have ties to the past, but you're also looking forward through these mechanisms. True, but we have a strong core in the insurance banking and asset part, and and we believe that there will still be ins classical insurers with regards to the need to insure perilous risks and emerging risks um, in the future. So the concept of insurance will still be there, but we think that the way how insurance is delivered is changing. It's moving more into an omni-channel and hybrid approach from our point of view. But having said that. We are also addressing those customer groups that that are truly going into the fully digital mode. And um, that's why we have incubated our own digital insurer in Germany a couple of years ago, who shows basically a doubling of its uh, premium volume year over year. And uh, I mentioned before that we, we are at the verge of going into the next European market, and we are actually doing it with this digital business model. Um, we are taking that uh, digital insurer Friday by name from Germany into the French market with the assumption that digital business models are easier, obviously, to uh, transfer into new markets. And we look forward to um, this new growth opportunity. So the core of insurance remains the same. The goal of insurance remains the same. But would it be then accurate to say you're adapting it to modern consumer expectations? That would be a nice way of putting it. I would agree with that. And um, on top of that, we are essentially adding the two dimensions of our ecosystems engagement, predominantly in home and mobility, both to augment the insurance um, uh, offering with a network of value-adding components where insurance might be an embedded product in another primary solution that a customer wants um, or vice versa. But also, um, we think that it's very, very smart to move also in fastly developing new and emerging opportunities like, for example, mobility. Why is that so important for insurers? because there's this concept of triple zero. That means um, zero emissions. We are going to electric or, or um, hydrogen uh, engines sooner or later. We, are, we have zero ownership. We see more and more share economy and pay as you go opportunities. And the third one is zero accidents. If you think about a world with predominantly autonomous uh, vehicles, then the likelihood of uh, collisions is uh, is diminishing. And what does it mean for traditional non-life insurers that are often quite heavily exposed in the motor insurance market? It means that a core component of the business might be melting in the foreseeable future. So you need to find new ways of acting in this mobility space if you want to compensate uh, the loss of premium due to the changing landscape. We have another question from Twitter, again from Arsalan. Arsalan asks great questions. questions. How do you encourage innovation outside of IT among your employees? We very much believe in the entrepreneurial capabilities of our workforce. And what we have adopted is an innovation process that is uh, called Kickbox. It was developed by a telecom provider here in Switzerland, uh, Swisscom by name. And we are using the process which allows employees to ideate an idea. Then they get something that's called a red box. The red box helps them to develop the business idea. They get a little bit of resources, meaning money, to invest into the idea. And then you have a quality gate for ideas to go into the next stage, which is the blue box, where you get dedicated capacity to work on your idea. You get a little bit more money. You get support from the organization with regards to sponsorship. Um, and ultimately, you might get into a gold box status where you go into the market, you develop an MVP. And uh, we now have the first examples where customer-driven ideas are actually leading to a spin-off of an own business model and an own company, um, in our example, in the mobility space. And we just launched a similar campaign in the home environment and obviously hope for similar success there. So obviously, involving customers at the core of innovation is very important to you. 
the customer engagement and the market testing is very important, but also um, giving this entrepreneurial opportunity to the to our own workforce is very important um, because they are they are working in that market. They know the customers, they understand their needs, and they are very well positioned um, to develop very innovative new ideas, both for our core business as well as for our diversify the core opportunities. So it's a matter of uh, both customer co-innovation as well as really encouraging internal innovation among your employees. Exactly. And that is linking back to the first que- or to the other question with the internal bias, because we get challenged by our own workforce. Why are we not going in a different way? And they can express that in this innovation process, which makes it very interesting. Now we have yet another great question coming from Twitter. We really get great questions on Twitter and, and LinkedIn from the audience. Puran Kshatriya, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, says, how do you find the right balance between cost optimization and innovation? You need to be able to manage your cost base to create the freedom and space to innovate. And the important thing for me is that you have some sort of continuity in innovation and some sort of predictability of resources. Otherwise, it gets very frustrating for the people who innovate if they run out of support along the journey. And not every idea is fit for for market in a very short time frame, especially when you think about new business models that need time to grow. And then you need the stamina as a company to support them during that growth period if they obviously hit certain milestones and and show progress. But at the base of that is getting your basics right. We need to, as a technologist now, we need to make sure that we have stable and reliable processes, um, that the business is running, that we are there for our customers. And we need to be cost competitive to be able to generate the cash that can then partially be reinvested into innovation. And that for me is essentially the link between cost effectiveness and innovation. And quite frankly, part of our innovation is to become more cost effective. Um, And uh, in this way, you also have a relationship between the two. Okay, and we have another really uh, interesting and insightful question from Twitter. Your strategy seems to contain an objective to become the host of an entire services platform in terms of the house and home. Thoughts on that? If you think about the our, our financial core with the services, the home environment is relatively close to it. You need to finance a home, which might be a banking mortgage. You need to insure the home, which might be an insurance product. Um, so in this way, those two worlds are closely linked. But What we also try to achieve there is to invest into platforms that that are at the core of certain uh, stakeholder groups in that ecosystem. For example, services for homeowners, how to modernize your home, you manage your home, or um, for building communities where you have different parties and houses, how they engage with each other and with the owner of the location. So... Um, We do not necessarily need to be the orchestrator in all cases, but we want to be, we want to have a seat at the table and where there is the opportunity, obviously, we also like to orchestrate, but that is a very lofty and ambitious goal. Um, And uh, it's more likely that more often than not, you become a player in an ecosystem rather than the owner of the ecosystem. But for you, being part of that ecosystem with your platform is a crucial part of what you're doing. Exactly. And that is part of our ecosystem strategy, where in those two focus topics of home and mobility, we want to create services that obviously should and can link to our core, but that are also providing value to our customers outside of the traditional scope of insurance. And that's why we call it our diversify the core pillar, which goes beyond our traditional scope um, to provide a network of services Um, that are just creating solutions and not just products. And those solutions should and can include contributions from other 
um, participants in the market, because it's very unlikely that in any ecosystem, a single player is providing all the value contribution steps. It's very clear that for you, digital transformation, digital transformation is not just about marketing or some kind of veneer. How did you develop this strategy? Where did this strategy come from? It came from the realization that um, that there is so much opportunity in the insurance space and and also at Baloas to become uh, simpler, um, to radically simplify our products and services, and also the realization of the quickly changing external customer expectations, market environments. It's essentially an adaption to the 21st century with an idea and a business model that's Lloyds of London, more than 400 years old. And at the core, as I said, the the um, coverage of risk and the being there in the moment of need is unchanged, but how it is consumed, how it can be um, part of a bigger solution, that is essentially the evolution and the development um, that we are driving with our strategy to provide um, solutions that make the life of our customers simpler and safer in a more holistic way than a traditional insurer alone. We have another question from Twitter, and this is from Marcus Teed. The trend to zero ownership and the sharing economy has been the core of modern IT for decades via open source. Wouldn't open source be a very good basis for building insurance ecosystems? I think open source in general is a great idea because it's the IT um form of open innovation. Uh, I think the quality can be better. I think the value contribution can be better. And um, Baloas is already trying to be very active. Um, uh, and we have if we have a number of employees that are extremely engaged in open innovation and open source activities. And we would, uh, we would welcome anybody who wants to collaborate with us. Um, we also are a fan of uh, co-evolution and, and co-development of solutions in Switzerland. We have a joint core system for one part of our business with some of our market, um, with some of the other market players. So um, open source, as I said, is part of our open innovation strategy. And um, we have good expertise there. We would love to do more. And uh, the question is always finding the right partners to accelerate. And uh, if here is an opportunity to find new partners, um, please contact us and we are happy to collaborate. You spoke about cloud earlier. Can you give us an update on your cloud journey, where you are, and most importantly, why is cloud important for you? Cloud is important for us because what we want to achieve is that we have um, scalable, reliable, efficient, and effective compute platforms, call them that way, or digital platforms that are just available and easy to use for our application teams. Why is that important? Because we want our application teams to have the enablement and the authority to develop in their speed and own time and to deploy when they want um, independent of a very complex infrastructure delivery cycle. So if you think about the opportunities you can generate with DevOps and ultimately business DevOps capabilities, you need digital platforms underlying that to IT enable that. That's why the cloud um, journey for us is so important. Where we are in that is I call it, we have a cloud triple jump strategy. And the triple jump is that we, are, um, we have a, a fast track for more SaaS-oriented vendor cloud solutions. But most of our applications are developed not in a zero outage kind of way that leverage the capabilities of cloud environments because they, they might be a little older and uh, we're not intended to work in that environment. That's why our triple jump is we, we go into the public cloud where possible and where it makes sense. Um, but we have the majority of our applications moving to private cloud 
to bring them up to speed in with cloud capabilities and to then develop strategies if and when we want to move them into the public cloud. So it's a progressive strategy with the objective eventually of being very significantly in the public cloud. Exactly. It's also slightly related uh, how we check, how we tackle the security and, and uh, say, uh, regulatory topics of that. But we want to have cloud capabilities as a cloud first strategy for new applications and developments. And the cloud capability might be private cloud or to a growing share public cloud in the future. What advice do you have for chief information officers to remain relevant and to grow innovation and to grow their own value? I think right now is the best time to be in IT and to be a CIO or a CTO. I think it's bonanza time. Um, with all the changes that are currently happening and all the opportunities that are out there, but also the challenges that need to be addressed, um, not forgetting what everybody had to do with this uh, nasty pandemic that we have out there. I think now is the time where CIOs and CTOs are more important than ever. When everything is on cruise control, you might not be that visible and you might not have the opportunity to influence change. But now where there is so much in flux and IT progressing so quickly, it's the best time to basically jump on that horse and enjoy the ride and drive the change um, by explaining and showing how business capabilities and customer value can be realized with modern technologies and who's best positioned for that. It's the CIO, CTO, and their teams to, to explain that and to showcase that. And therefore, I think it's the best time to have that job. Okay. Alexander Bockelman, Group CTO of Belois Group. Thank you very much for taking time to be with us again today. Michael, I enjoyed it. And thanks for all the questions from, Tripa, uh, from, from Twitter and your audience. Uh, it was fun. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for watching, especially those folks who contributed questions and comments. Your questions are great, you know, and we, we love them. Go to cxotalk.com. Check out our upcoming shows. We have great shows coming up. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so you can get our newsletter. It's a really good newsletter. Thanks so much, everybody. I hope you have a great day. We'll see you soon.